so hi everybody. I hope everybody is doing well. So as Mar mentioned, I'm Justine. I'm a first year master's student working here at the Douglas and I'll be moderating this talk this morning. So it's my great pleasure to welcome Masa Dadara for today's CIC lecture. Dr. Masa received her bachelor's and master's degrees in electrical engineering from the University of Tehran and Concordia University and her PhD in biomedical engineering from McGill. She did a postdoctoral fellowship with the International Progressive MS Alliance team at McGill, followed by a joint postdoctoral fellowship between the Cervo Brain Research Center in Quebec and the University of Alberta in Edmonton. So thank you very much, Masa, for being here today. Uh, just a quick reminder to everyone to keep the mics closed during the presentation. Uh, as we mentioned, I'll be monitoring the chat so you can write your questions in there or simply raise your hand and I'll just find an opportune moment to, uh, to ask them. And Dr. Dadar has also agreed to hold a student discussion at the end of the talk for any more uh, open discussion questions. So anyone who wants to can stick around for that as well. So with that, Masa, thanks again for taking the time to give this lecture today and the floor is yours. No problem. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for having me today. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about the impact that presence of cerebrovascular pathology can have in different neurodegenerative diseases and why we, wanted, we might want to include detection of cerebrovascular disease markers in our aging and neurodegenerative disease populations. Yes. Cerebrovascular disease in general refers to all of the pathological processes that impact the health of the vessels, blood vessels in the brain. It can be detected both in vivo using a structural MRI and as well as ex vivo using a histopathology analysis. The three major signs of cerebrovascular disease that are generally visible on a structural MRI in vivo are white matter hyperinfusives infarcts and microbleeds that I've shown example of, examples of here on the figure on the right. White matter hyperintensities, which I'm going to talk about in more detail today, mainly reflect uh, ischemic in injury due to arteriolosclerosis or hardening of the small arteries in the brain. And atherosclerosis or buildup of fats, cholesterol, and other um, substances in the artery walls. They are also associated with axonal and myelin loss, particularly in patients with comorbid neurodegenerative pathology. Microbleeds are small perivascular hemorrhages that can occur in both in gray matter and white matter brain areas. Infarcts are small localized areas of dead tissue resulting from failure of blood supply. So white matter hyperintensities are generally the most prevalent out of these three uh, MRI measures. And uh, each of these different cerebrovascular disease-related markers can be have been reported in, the, in patients that have pure or comorbid cerebrovascular disease pathology. Cerebrovascular disease is the most common vascular cause of dementia and the second most common cause of dementia after Alzheimer's disease in the aging population, and its prevalence increases with age. In addition, as high as 75% of patients with other types of dementia, such as Alzheimer's dementia, Lewy body dementia, and frontotemporal dementia, can present with comorbid cerebrovascular disease pathology at the time of their death and autopsy. The figure on the right here shows prevalence of different cerebrovascular disease-related pathologies in 478 individuals with Alzheimer's dementia at autopsy showing that 78% of the patients had moderate or greater levels of at least one type of cerebrovascular disease-related pathology at the time of their autopsy. The figure on the left shows how much the presence of, presence of each type of pathology can increase the probability of a diagnosis of Alzheimer's dementia. So cerebrovascular disease is not only common as, a, as the sole cause of dementia on its own, it also very frequently coexists with other neurodegenerative pathologies, making the patient's symptoms much worse than if they only had their neurodegenerative pathology and lowering their threshold for a clinical diagnosis of dementia. Typically, patients with cerebrovascular disease have mental slowness and progress 
problems with executive function, such as uh, higher orders, cognitive functions, um, planning, organizing, and monitoring behavior. Memory problems and cognitive impairment and increased risk of dementia as well as behavioral symptoms and psychological symptoms, including apathy, irritability, and anxiety and depression are also frequent in cerebrovascular disease patients. Other neurological signs and symptoms, including Parkinsonism, rigidity, and gait difficulties can also occur in patients with cerebrovascular disease. In addition to the old age, the common risk factors for cerebrovascular disease are hypertension, high cholesterol levels, diabetes and obesity, and alcohol abuse and smoking. On the bright side, there are recent studies that have suggested that targeting vascular risk factors might actually slow down progression of cerebrovascular disease and the consequent cognitive decline in patients that have pure or comorbid cerebrovascular pathology. For example, Active blood pressure lowering in cerebrovascular disease patients that have hypertension might slow down progression of, progression of cerebrovascular disease and prevent or slow down cognitive decline as well. So given that there are treatment options available that might improve patient outcomes, it is important to be able to assess and evaluate cerebrovascular disease burden in aging and neurodegenerative disease populations. Today, I'm going to focus on white matter hyperintensities as the most common MRI sign of cerebrovascular disease. First, I'm going to talk a bit about um, how they can be detected, and then I'll go over a few applications where I use white matter hyperintensity uh, segmentation uh, at, to study the impact of cerebrovascular disease in, on gray matter atrophy and clinical symptoms in Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease patients. Then I'm going to talk a bit about other image analysis applications where it might be important to segment white matter hyperintensities, in particular to improve gray matter um, measurements. White matter hyperintensities are defined as non-specific hyperintense areas that are visible on FLIR, T2-weighted, and PDMRs. They're also visible to a lesser extent as hypointensities on T1-weighted images. As the most prevalent MRI sign of cerebrovascular disease, white matter hyperintensities are the ones that are usually assessed when studying cerebrovascular disease uh, in vivo. Detecting white matter hyperintensities can be challenging for a few reasons. First, the optimal flare and T2 sequences that are used to detect the white matter hyperintensities are generally acquired at lower resolution in publicly available large data sets with a slight, a slight thicknesses that usually range between three to five millimeters. In addition, the location, texture, and pattern of the white matter hyperintensities can actually vary a lot between different patients and across different diseases. So they actually might present with um, fuzzy borders, making it very difficult to delineate the exact same area as white matter hyperintensities when you're manually segmenting them. So manually segmenting white matter hyperintensities is very time consuming and um, subject to inter-rater and intra-rater variability, and having automated methods can, that can accurately and consistently detect white matter hyperintensities would be very useful for research and clinical applications. Um, during my PhD work, I developed a, an automated tool to segment white matter hyperintensities from a structural MRIs in different multi-center and multi-scanner databases that then we can use them to um, study the impact of cerebrovascular disease in large publicly available data sets. Um, the pipeline that I um, developed was trained and validated based on different combinations of T1, T2, PD, and FLIR scans from a library of cases that I selected from different publicly available data sets to have a wide range of scanner models and parameters, as well as H6, white metal hyperintensity load and distribution, to be sure that the final tool um, would be able to accurately detect the white metal hyperintensities in different multi-center and multi-scanner data sets. Um, my segmentation tool and all of the pre-trained models are publicly available and can be used to segment white matter hyperintensities from any combination of T1, T2, PD, and flare images. Um, it can even segment the white matter hyperintensities using only T1-weighted images, for example, for legacy data sets that don't have any of the optimal T2, PD, and flare contrasts available. There are also other publicly available white matter hyperintensity segmentation pipelines that one can use to detect the white matter hyperintensities. For example, 
there is Biancoff by the FSL group, there is LSD by the SBM group, and Free Surfer. Um, although I should mention that um, the free, free surfer segments white matter hyper intensity is based on T1 weighted images. So these are actually T1 weighted hypo intensities, intensities that are being segmented and are generally less sensitive to showing white matter hyper intensities, um, a point that I'm going to get back to later today. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about an application in Alzheimer's disease where we investigated the relationship between white matter hyperintensities and known biomarkers of Alzheimer's disease. We used data from uh, 720 normal controls, individuals with microcognitive impairment and Alzheimer's disease patients from the ADNI data set that had all MRI and clinical assessments from baseline visit and one year follow-up visit available. Um, the question that we wanted to answer was, how do white matter hyperintensities relate to biomarkers of Alzheimer's disease? Specifically, we wanted to establish a temporal relationship between different biomarkers. So I segmented, segmented the white matter hyperintensities using my pipeline. To have an overall measure of neurodegeneration, we use white matter and deformation-based morphometry in the gray matter regions. And we use CSF amyloid beta as uh, an indirect measure of the amyloid beta burden in the brain. We use Alzheimer's disease assessment as well or ADOS-13 scores as, measure, as measures of cognitive performance and included presence of APOE4 allies and vascular risk factors, including hypotension, BMI, glucose, cholesterol, and triglyceride levels as covariates in our models. First, we wanted to establish if all of these biomarkers are related to each other cross-sectionally. To investigate this relationship between different biomarkers, we use partial correlations between baseline variables, controlling for age, sex, years of education, vascular risk factors, and modality of segmentation. Segmentation modality here is a categorical variable that indicates whether what matter hyperintensities were segmented using T1 and FLAR scans or T1 and T2 and PD scans to account for any potential differences in their segmentations, since ADNI1 only acquired T2 PD scans and ADNI2 and ADNI go only acquired FLAR images. And T2 and FLAR have different um, sensitivity levels uh, for detection of white matter hyperintensities in the border areas. The arrows in this figure show the significant relationships between biomarker pairs. Basically, we found that all of the baseline variables were significantly associated with each other when looking at them cross-sectionally. Next, we wanted to establish a temporal relationship between these variables. To do this, we again use a set of linear regression models. Each model included baseline values for all of the biomarkers, as well as vascular risk factors, APOE4, age six, education level, and segmentation modality as covariates. The dependent variables of interest were longitudinal change in each measure of white matter hyperintensity burden, gray matter atrophy, amyloid beta level, and cognition. The idea here is that if longitudinal change in measure Y is associated with the baseline value of measure X, when we are also including the baseline value of measure Y itself, as well as all other possible contributors in the model, then X is probably contributing the, to the longitudinal change in Y, establishing a temporal and causal relationship between these two variables. The model on the right here summarizes the results of our analysis. As expected, controlling for A6 diagnostic cohort and segmentation modality, vascular risk factors such as hypertension, higher systolic and diastolic blood pressure, higher glucose levels, and higher BMI were all associated with higher white matter hyperintensity loads at, at baseline. In addition, we found that baseline white matter hyperintensities were associated with longitudinal gray matter atrophy. Whereas baseline gray matter atrophy was not significantly associated with longitudinal white matter hyperintensity progression. This indicates that white matter hyperintensities might precede and cause some of the gray matter atrophy that happens in Alzheimer's disease populations. Similarly, we found that baseline amyloid levels were associated with longitudinal progression of white matter hyperintensities, whereas baseline white matter hyperintensities were not associated with longitudinal change in amyloid levels. Again, indicating that at least part of the white matter hyperintensities in Alzheimer's disease populations are due to changes in amyloid levels. Finally, in addition to baseline cognition, we found that white matter hyperintensities and amyloid beta levels both uh, 
significantly and independently contributed to longitudinal cognitive decline, indicating that the white spots are hyperintensities contribute to additional cognitive deficits in Alzheimer's disease patients that cannot be explained by amyloid. So taken together, all of these results indicate that white matter hyperintensities are closely intertwined with the known biomarkers of Alzheimer's disease and can cause additional gray matter atrophy and cognitive deficits in the patients. Together with the possibility that white matter hyperintensity progression might be slowed down or even prevented through antihypertensive medications or lifestyle changes, this raises the possibility for intervention before some of the irreversible neurological damage occurs. This is also in line with the studies that show that reduction of certain vascular disease risk factors um, can decrease risk of cognitive decline in Alzheimer's disease populations that are mostly in those that have comorbid cerebrovascular disease. However, including vascular risk factors and baseline white matter hyperintensity burden in the model, we also observed an association between baseline amyloid levels and increase in white matter hyperintensity load lending support to the hypothesis that amyloid deposition in the brain could also increase white matter hyperintensity burden by accelerating processes that are not necessarily vascular in nature. So these results suggest that some, at least some of the white matter hyperintensities that are observed in Alzheimer's disease populations might not result from um, vascular risk factors and might result from amyloid de deposition and Alzheimer's disease related pathologies. And so they might not respond well to treatment of vascular risk factors. So future studies, specifically those that target the underlying pathology of white matter hyperintensities in Alzheimer's dementia patients are therefore necessary to disentangle these causes and consequences of white matter hyperintensities in Alzheimer's disease. In the next two studies that I'm going to talk about today, we assess the relationship between white matter hyperintensities and gray matter atrophy and cognitive and gait de deficits in Parkinson's disease patients. In both the studies, we use data from the PPMI dataset, which includes uh, MRI and clinical information from 800 newly diagnosed early Parkinson's disease patients and match controls. Similar to the previous study, we first wanted to establish a temporal relationship between white matter hyperintensities, neurodegeneration, and cognitive decline. Again, I segmented the white matter hyperintensities using my pipeline. We used CVET to measure cortical thickness at baseline and one year follow up visits to have an estimate of the longitudinal cortical thinning. We used MOCA scores as our measure of cognitive decline. The figure on the left here shows Kaplan Mayer graphs of survival analysis for PD patients and MASH controls. Here we dichotomize the patients into high versus patients and controls, both into high versus low white matter hyperintensity, burden groups based on a median speed. We define this table decline of two points in MOCA as our event of cognitive decline, and then compared longitudinal, longitudinal survival trajectories of high versus low white matter hyperintensity burden controls and Parkinson's disease patients over an average of four years of follow-up. As you can see by comparing the blue survival trajectories on the left, the control subjects and Parkinson's disease patients with low white matter hyperintensity burden had very similar trajectories of cognitive decline, whereas the PD patients with high white matter hyperintensity burden had significantly greater levels of cognitive decline than most control subjects with high white matter hyperintensity loads and Parkinson's disease patients with low white matter hyperintensity loads. The figure on the right here shows the association between continuous white matter hyperintensity loads and MOCA scores separately for controls and Parkinson's disease patients. Colder colors here indicate lower MOCA values in each image. So we found basically similar results assessing more common white matter hyperintensities as continuous variables using mixed effects models, where higher white matter hyperintensity loads led to significantly greater decline in MOCA values for the Parkinson's disease patients, but not in the control. These results also indicate a synergistic interaction between white matter hyperintensities and PDS status, where white matter hyperintensities led to significantly more cognitive deficits for Parkinson's disease patients than if the same amount of white matter hyperintensities occurred in individuals without Parkinson's disease.
Finally, we found that cortical thinning in the follow-up year was also significantly associated with baseline white matter hyperintensity burden in the Parkinson's disease patients, both on average and in a cluster in the right frontal lobe. This cortical thinning was also associated with longitudinal cognitive decline in the PD patients. So taken together, these findings again suggest that white matter hyperintensities in de novo Parkinson's disease patients precede later cognitive decline, even in the patients that exhibit no cognitive symptoms at baseline because these are de novo Parkinson's disease patients. Um, so prevention and treatment of risk factors associated with white matter hyperintensities might be a promising avenue to slow down cognitive decline, especially in de novo Parkinson's disease patients that are still largely cognitively asymptomatic. However, there is also evidence linking white matter hyperintensities and dementia in Parkinson's disease to orthostatic hypotension, a common occurrence in Parkinson's disease that can be aggravated um, with antihypertensive medications, especially as the disease progresses. So this indicates the need for a tailored management of uh, hypertension in Parkinson's disease patients where extreme care might, might be, you know, should be taken to avoid over-treating hypertension. Um, other potentially modifiable options that um, are um, uh, cholesterol and triglyceride levels, body mass index, type 2 diabetes, and insulin levels, and a smoker. So in the previous two studies, we established that um, there's a relationship between white matter hyperintensities at baseline and longitudinal gray matter atrophy and cognitive decline in both Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease populations. Now I want to talk a bit about another study that we looked at the impact of white matter hyperintensities on freezing of gait, which is one of the more common uh, motor symptoms that Parkinson's disease patients develop during the course of their disease. Freezing of gait is characterized by a sudden transient and, transient and unexpected interruption in walking, usually during gait initiation or while the patient is turning. Based on the previous literature, we know that loss of substantial nigral neurons, dopaminergic neurodegeneration, and amyloid burden are linked to development of freezing of gait in Parkinson's disease patients. A few more recent studies have also reported associations between white matter hyperintensity burden and freezing of gait, both in Parkinson's disease patients and in other individual aging individuals without Parkinson's disease. Based on this, the previous study that I talked about and other studies in the literature, we also know that white matter hyperintensities can be associated with amyloid burden. So the question here that we wanted to answer was, how are these different biomarkers related to each other? and how does their combination impact freezing of gait in Parkinson's disease patients. Again, we use deformation-based morphometry to measure atrophy in the substantia nigra. We use average DAS levels in the putamen and caudate as our measure of dop dopaminergic neurodegeneration. We use CSF amyloid as, a, as an indirect measure of amyloid burden in the brain. And uh, again, I calculated white matter hyperintensity burden based on my segmentations. To investigate the relationship between different biomarkers, we use partial correlations between baseline variables, controlling for levodopa equivalent dose, use of cardiovascular medication, age six, and disease duration. The figure on the left here shows the significant relationships between different biomarkers. Similar to the previous study, we found that um, we found a significant association between CSF amyloid beta and white water hyperintensity burden. We also found significant relationships between substantial nigra atrophy and estriatal DAC levels. However, neither white matter hyperintensity load nor amyloid levels were associated with DAC levels, indicating that they might not be a, um, part of the same type of pathology. In addition, we found that when assessed separately, all of the baseline values of all of the four different biomarkers were significantly different between Parkinson's disease patients that developed freezing of gait in their follow-up visits and those that didn't. Um, I should point out here that uh, none of the Parkinson's disease patients had freezing of gait at their baseline assessment since they were all de novo. Um, 
So with the previous analysis, we established that all of the four biomarkers were significantly related to future freezing of gait in Parkinson's disease patients. We also saw that uh, white matter hyperintensities and amyloid levels were related to each other. So now our question was whether, white matter, uh, whether amyloid beta levels cause um, higher amyloid beta burden causes future freezing of gait in Parkinson's disease patients by increasing white matter hyperintensity burden. And if yes, if this relationship is independent of the PDA specific pathologies of substantial hyperatrophy and dopaminergic neurodegeneration, since we didn't observe an association between those values and white matter hyperintensities. To answer these questions, we use mediation analysis. Mediation analysis is basically a set of regression models that can be used to explore the underlying mechanism by which one variable can influence another variable through a mediator variable. Here, in the investigated whether white matter hyperintensity burden mediated the impact of amyloid on future freezing of gait in Parkinson's disease patients. CSF of amyloid burden mm, was, was the independent variable, future freezing of gait was a dependent variable, and white matter hyperintensity burden was the mediator variable. In addition, we included um, substantial microatrophy, striatal data activity, low dopa equivalent dose use of cardiovascular medications, age six, and disease duration as covariates in the mediation analysis. The results of, supported the existence of a mediation effect of white matter hyperintensities on CSF amyloid, indicating that amyloid burden might impact future freezing of gait in Parkinson's disease patients through an increase in white matter hyperintensity burden, independently of substantial neurogastrophy and a straight of that activity. So taken together, these results suggest that development of freezing of gait in Parkinson's disease patients has a multi-pathway etiology, emphasizing the need for multimodal uh, interventions, including those that target cerebrovascular risk factors. Since freezing of gait only um, shows partial response to dopaminergic medications, establishing a link between white matter hyperintensities and future freezing of gait in Parkinson's disease patients uh, provides potential treatment options for PD patients with white matter hyperintensities. So to summarize, we have established that white matter hyperintensities can lead to additional gray matter atrophy and clinical symptoms in both Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease populations. And since they seem to precede some of the gray matter atrophy, this raises the possibility for intervention before irreversible neurodegenerative damage occurs. These findings um, suggest that we should assess white matter hyperintensities and treat them with a higher priority in these populations while being careful to tailor the treatment for each patient to avoid, for example, over-treating hypertension in patients that are prone to static hypotension. In fact, several recent studies have shown that multi-domain lifestyle interventions and management of risk, risk factors that are associated with white matter hyperintensities, such as hypertension, can actually slow down both post-white matter hyperintensity progression and cognitive decline in aging in individuals with pure or comorbid cerebrovascular disease. More importantly, risk factors such as hypertension high cholesterol levels, obesity, diabetes, smoking, and physical inactivity can be targeted earlier on as preventive strategies. It has been estimated that such interventions might actually lead to a reduction of approximately one third of all dementia cases, mostly those that have pure or comorbid cerebrovascular disease. Identifying which types of interventions would benefit which patients uh, based on their pathology profiles and clinical symptoms is therefore most likely to uh, help at-risk individuals. Now I'm going to take, um, now I'm going to shift gears a bit uh, to a more methodological question. Other than studying white matter hyperintensities themselves directly or including them as covariates in our models, why should we detect white matter hyperintensities in aging and neurodegenerative disease populations? As I mentioned before, white matter hyperintensities generally appear hypo-intense on T1-weighted images, and their intensities can range anywhere from close to normal appearing white matter signal to the same intensities as cortical and subcortical gray matter, and even darker. 
So the question here is, if wet matter hyperintensities appear adjacent to gray matter areas or whether anywhere else for that matter, would what in the gray matter segmentation pipelines that we generally use be able to distinguish wet matter hyperintensities from gray matter? And what happens if they don't? Tissue classification is one of the MRI analysis tools that is very commonly used in itself and also as a first step in many other pipelines, such as cortical thickness and surface extractions, voxel-based morphometry, and DWI image analysis. So what happens with the tissue classification results of commonly used pipelines when the subjects have a lot of wet matter hyperintensities? Here is an example of a t one weighted image of an aging subject with a lot of wet matter hyperintensities. The manual labels show the standard of what the segmentation should have been. The other columns are examples of how Atropos from Ants Bison, which is a tissue classification tool that I've developed fast from FSL and SPM segmented this case. The red arrows show the areas of white matter hyperintensities that are frequently mislabeled by automated tissue classification tools. Overall, looking at tissue classification results in data sets that have moderate to severe white matter hyperintensity burden, we find that although um, Bison is able to successfully detect most of the white matter hyperintensities as white matter, Atropos and BAST commonly segment them as gray matter. SPM segments most of the white matter hyperintensities as white matter. However, the presence of white matter hyperintensities can lead to gross under segmentation of the gray matter and over segmentation of the white matter. I should point out here that um, Bison was trained specifically using lifespan data, including many age subjects that have uh, white matter hyperintensities. So it was probably able to learn the distribution of white matter hyperintensities better. Um, whereas the other um, tools that, um, whereas the, uh, the other tools have mostly been developed based on young, healthy individuals, and so might not work in aging um, data sets. Just to give you an idea of what kind of errors these types of initial errors in tissue classification can generate, here is an example of a case with high white matter hyperintensity burden that was processed by CIVET without any correction of the tissue classification errors that had um, segmented the white matter hyperintensities as gray matter. The orange arrows show the areas of error when their inclusion of white matter hyperintensities in the gray matter mass led to CVET, including them in its cortical surface extractions. You can even see some of the periventricular white matter hyperintensities ending up in there. So we've kind of established that if you use pipelines that have been developed based on healthy and young adult data and don't correct the gray matter segmentation results, there will be white matter hyperintensity related errors that get propagated into the gray matter measurements. The next question that we had was, what about FreeSurfer? As those that use FreeSurfer know, FreeSurfer has, has a separate class for white matter hyperintensities that many people also use to extract white matter hyperintensity measurements. So in theory, since it's already segmenting the white matter hyperintensities as a separate class, its segmentations might not have this type of error, right? Um, as I'm sure many of you have seen or had um, yourself have had a strange associations where gray matter volumes have increased with age or presence of a particular pathology that you expected would be, um, need to increase atrophy. One of the regions that this happens in a lot is the carotid, which is also where the white matter hyperintensities are likely to happen um, a lot. There are several studies reporting associations between higher carotid volumes and age, and a U-shaped uh, care for the relationship between carotid volume and age. So what we did in this study was to run free surfer in admin data, segment the white matter hyperintensities based on T2 and flare, and then look to see if we have a, and they have a systematic overlap and if this overlap impacts gray matter-based analysis results, for example, for the carotid region. The figure on the right here shows examples, an example of a segmented case um, for both free surfer and white matter hyperintensities based on flare image and T2 images. The red regions in the last row 
show the areas of overlap where the white water hyperintensities are segmented as coded by preserver. The figure on the left shows the relationship between white water hyperintensity volume and the overlap of white matter hyperintensity burden and caudate segmented by free surfer, basically showing that free surfer, free surfer keeps segmenting larger and larger caudates that's up for subjects that have more and more white matter hyperintensities. The problem here is that the relationship between segmentation errors and uh, white matter hyperintensity burden, burden is systematic. So it might not um, just end up as noise in the data. It might be systematic enough that it would actually cancel out the relationships that you should get, for example, in subjects that have subcortical atrophy. Since the white metal hyperintensity signal in, is in the opposite direction, then you don't, um, then either you don't get any results or even um, they might be uh, strong enough to that you end up getting results in the opposite direction. So to test this, we tried a, different, uh, a few different scenarios for the associations that we expected to get in the ADNA data set. Here is an example where we did not see any relationship between uncorrected college volume and cognitive performance as measured by ADAS 13 scores, um, but we did get the expected associations after correcting the white matter hyperintensity errors from the college segmentations. We found similar results when looking at differences between normal controls, MCI, and AD patients with other cognitive and also with other cognitive scores. Basically showing that correcting for white matter hyperintensities improved the association results. So I hope that I've convinced you that it's important to detect and study white matter hyperintensities both on their own as MRI biomarkers that can um, that are associated with different markers of neurodegeneration and also different clinical outcomes. Also, and as well as to improve the associations and results of other MRI-based analysis. Um, I would like to thank all of my collaborators and supervisors. Without them, none of this work would have been possible. And thank you for listening. All right, thank you so much, Masa, for that really, really great talk. That was no problem. very, very I'm interesting. I'm going to stop sharing my slides so that yeah, I no can problem. actually see people. All right, so if anybody has any questions, you can either write them in the chat or raise your hand. So I'll just start with, with one of my own in the meantime. Um, so I was just wondering, um, these when, when you you mentioned like analyzing uh, white matter hyperintensities and they can be like wrongly segmented into either gray matter or white matter um how much of like with previous studies that haven't taken this into account in their analyses how much of an impact does that have on on their findings do you think it's something like very significant um it depends. It depends on the population that you're looking at, and it also depends on the region that you're looking at. As I mentioned, white matter hyperintensities are um, very prevalent around the ventricles, and also they have a much higher prevalence in older adults and in patients with different neurodegenerative um, diseases. So, in those in those populations, the that, that's where the uh, impact is the highest. But if you look at the literature, actually, um, this is um, how we started um, putting together the results for this paper, is that basically people that are not aware of this problem um, report positive relationships between white matter hyperintensity volume and caudate volume or positive or, like, or increase in caudate volume when subjects get older. All of these are white matter hyperintensities that are segmented as gray matter, so they increase your caudate volumes. Um, in general, it, it would really depend on the quality of the QC that people do, um, but also detecting white matter hyperintensities versus caudate based on table weighted images is, is very difficult. That's why you usually acquire and should use FLIR or T2 weighted images to detect white matter hyperintensities so that we can actually correctly distinguish these borders. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, so we have a question in the chat from Julie. Um, a recent study by Moscoso in ADNI cohort found that baseline white matter hyperintensities was associated with amyloid accumulation over time. Um, could you speculate on potential differences with the current study? 
For example, may there be a difference on the directionality between white matter hyperintensities and amyloid depending on the diagnostic grouping studies. Uh, so CN preclinical or clinical MCI-AD. Yes. And was this investigated in your study? So this is, a, this is a great point, and this is one of the reasons actually that we looked at this association in um, this study. Basically, um, based on how you do the study and the population that you're looking at, many studies have reported associations between increased um, white muscle hyperintensity burden and baseline amyloid or inc increased longitudinal amyloid burden based on baseline white muscle hyperintensities. There are two different hypotheses. One of them is that, okay, um, the, the one that I explained, basically um, accumulation of amyloid might also increase white matter hyperintensity burden in true processes that might not be vascular in nature. But the other thing is that um, impaired clearance uh, of amyloid, uh, which can be due to cerebrovascular pathology, can actually lead to increasing amyloid beta ac accumulation. So you have these two uh, competing processes and it would really depend on the population that you're looking at. So one of, that was one of the reasons that we designed our study the way that we did. So our models include both amyloid and white matter hyperintensity burden at baseline as covariates in them. And then we look at how much increase we have in each measure. So um, I, I'm not sure if in that paper they had the same study design or if this, these were the exact same um, subjects, but these are things that would impact the results on the finding. The other thing that I would uh, I should probably mention is that like amyloid, um, there are studies that have even um, reported like additional amyloid beta accumulation in um, subjects that have vessel related pathologies that are not related to vascular risk factor, for example, head injuries, things like that. So there are two um, processes that are going side by side. It depends on um, how you look at the problem and which population you're looking at, whether you find a, a bigger impact of one process or the other. Great, uh, Malar, go ahead. Yep. Thanks, Masa. Uh, great talk. I have uh, two questions. The first one is in that particular study with the amyloid, did you examine any, any of the impacts of tau as well? Um, no, the, the reason we didn't was that we uh, basically, we were trying to um, have a very clean set of subjects that have everything and tau would have reduced our sample size a lot. Um, I think already for longitudinal amyloid out of 720 subjects, like 150 of them had amyloid in longitudinal follow-up on amyloid. And for tau, that was like a, mu a much smaller sample. So we, we didn't look at that in that population. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, for the last piece, I, I really liked, you know, how you mentioned, you know, that you need to QC your data and that, you know, predictably and that, uh, you know, that, that there are errors to be had if you don't account for these, these type of, uh, pathologies in your data. The one question I had was that, is there also a way in which to, you know, so free surfer might be particularly sensitive to these errors, errors even, if, even if it does, you know, attempt to account for them because of the way free surfer works, right? Because I, mean, I don't know about the newer versions of free surfer, but certainly some of the more well-used ones and the, you know, version 6.x and, and lower uh, because it uses spatial information and intensity information. Um, now, I suspect something like that is, uh, true of, of the newer version as well. But uh, if you use something that was more model-based with a correction, uh, I, I almost feel like that would almost be more likely to, or multi-atlas with a correction, you'd, you'd probably have a better chance of getting um, more accurate results. Can you speak to that at all? Yes, definitely. So um, in general, I, what I find is that first of all, um, using methods that have been actually validated and evaluated on aging and, and neurodegenerative disease populations is really preferable to methods that have been developed based on synthetic data or based on data such that only include young, healthy adults. So that's one of the things. Uh, if, you're, if you're training and validation set includes subjects that have these problems, probably uh, you deal with them better mm, than just ignoring them and not um, looking at them. 
uh, but yes, basically either um, that's, that's uh, what Python my DC classification pipeline does as well, right? I don't um, use other sequences to, um, to segment the uh, white matter, I just use T1-weighted images. It's just that I have a problem probabilistic map of where the each um, um, each tissue class should should be happening should be occurring and that already um, along with the fact that I use um, subjects that have a lot of white matter intensities in my training library takes care of a lot of these problems on its own yeah there's a question from Jeremy go ahead uh, hi, thank you for the talk. Hi. Was great. Hi. It was great. Um, and my question was, um, I'm curious about what we know about what um, what causes the white matter hyperintensities, hyper but from like a physics point of view, uh, is it an increase in the water content of the tissue or some cellular changes that are underlying the, the signal change? So, yeah. Yeah, so, um, yes. Yes. Um, the reason I mentioned that white matter hyperintensities are defined as non-specific areas of hyperintensity in the um, in the flare image or a T2 weighted image is that they can be associated with a lot of different underlying pathology. But in general, yes, especially periventricular uh, white matter hyperintensities are due to um, edema increased um, water or liquid in the tissue, but they can also be associated with um, inflammation, um, external degeneration and neuronal degeneration in general, gliosis. So there are a lot of different underlying pathologies that are associated with white matter hyperintensities. And actually the pathology can be different in different regions, for example, periventricular versus deep white matter hyperintensities or in different pathologies, for example, frontal temporal dementia versus normal aging versus obese subjects um, have been shown to have more inflammation. So all of these are important contributors and it, uh, the signal that you see might be due to any of these, but you won't know until you um, have post-mortem information. Okay, yeah, thank you. And related to that, maybe just a quick follow up. Yeah. You, know if, uh, you know if we can see some hyperintensities in preclinical models so that we could maybe have some uh, histology or something? Uh, that is a very good question, yes. Um, I haven't looked at it myself, but um, based on some of my discussions with people from Dr. Hamill's lab, yes, that is something that can be actually looked at in preclinical models and hopefully we will look at look at them in the future, yeah. Okay, thank you. There's a question in the chat from Aurélie. Um, based on your results, do you think white matter hyperintensity volumes should become a standard covariate for most morphometry analyses in the context of neurodegenerative, neurodegenerative disorders uh, in a similar way that we often include TBV, for example? That's a great um question actually when I was when my paper was under peer review for um, the um, the paper about with for intensity related errors all of the reviewers that were assigned I feel like were in the same field because they were all doesn't um, saying doesn't everyone do this already do we really need to <laughs> say this to people but yes basically um, having a good white matter upper intensity segmentation would Im improve or dealing with the presence of white matter intensities in your population would improve your gray matter measurements on its own. But it's also another covariate. It's a, another type of pathology that can exist in a lot of the patients. So I, I'm, I don't remember if I mentioned this, but um, depending on the population that you're looking at, different countries, different populations have different levels of um, cerebrovascular risk factors. But, up to 65, 70% of your normal aging populations can have high levels of white matter hyperintensities. So if you just don't look at them, it's another covariate that might be explaining a lot of variability in your data that you're not considering. So yeah, I, I would suggest that. Great, thanks. I actually have another question. Um, sure. You mentioned that um, with your findings that these white matter hyperintensities uh, seem to cause or at least be part of the cause of uh, cortical atrophy and clinical symptoms. Um, and I, I just, I don't 
I don't remember if you mentioned this, are they usually present long before the onset of the disorder? So um, that, that's, a, that's another reason we had the design, the longitudinal design. We wanted to see if baseline, so prior to presence of atrophy, white water hyperintensities are related to longitudinal atrophy. And that's what we found in both data sets that we, lo we looked at. Other people that ha have since also looked at the um, same relationships and report similar associations. So there are, of course, like if you have, if you have gray matter atrophy, then the um, axons of the same neurons are gonna atrophy down the line as well. But it seems to be that the vascular related white matter hyperintensities in subjects that um, don't, don't yet, haven't yet had um, any neurodegenerative pathology might contribute to future gray matter atrophy and cognitive decline, yes. Okay, great, thanks, that's very interesting. Uh, and that's why, any... and that's why um, this is a like midlife um, risk factors that um, mm. midlife stage risk factor that if interventions actually target, it might improve um, outcomes down the line in late life stages. Yeah, for sure. Um, are there any other questions from anyone in the audience? All right, if not, um, so we can conclude the talk here. So thanks again. Uh, thanks very much, Mansa, for Thank this you. great talk today. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, anyone who wants to can stay for uh, the student discussion and a great rest of the day to everyone else.